thank you firstly for joining us. Um, it's really great to see some new people in and a couple of people who joined us in July for the first webinar. Um, this will be recorded and sent out so you can share it with anyone um, that you know has missed it. And all we're going to do to start with is we went into breakout rooms last time and asked you three questions. We collated all of your brilliant ideas um, and some of that kind of collaborative thinking about best practice. So we're gonna share that with you to start with. A Couple of questions that came in on that registration were around a bit around the menstrual cycle and supporting our female athletes. And then just delving a little bit more deeper into that session design. So how we can try and support our girls when we've got a group who are brand new and you know on the same pitch as someone who's potentially playing county or higher. So we, Hannah and myself will talk about that and try and share some of our experiences and also some of the experiences that you have as well. And then at the end, we're going to ask for another breakout room collaboration from you to see if we can get a little bit more sharing because we've got such a great group of coaches already in the in the virtual room that we have here. So that sharing of best practice and hopefully answering any more questions that you have will be right at the end. So these were the questions as a little refresher um, that we asked you in your breakout rooms. So we talked a lot around that social connection and how we can support our players. We know that girls um, have a really big importance placed on that social connection, that friendship group. So making sure what can we do as coaches to help support that. Second one was around collaborating with stakeholders. So it's great to see that um, some of you are already doing that and working out how and who you can work with if you've got lower numbers in your age groups. And then that last one was around um, contact confidence with our new players. The feedback has been good. Um, so this is a bit of bingo to start us off with. You don't need to shout out and there are no prizes, I'm afraid. Um, but just I'll read you through these. If you're doing this already, brilliant, tick in the old box. But hopefully there'll be some ideas in here that you're not using already around that social connection piece. So ideas that came from the group were around using social media um, and linking in our parents a little bit more. So there's quite a few suggestions around using a parental system and social sessions with parents, not necessarily always the type of social sessions we might be thinking of, but making sure that they're getting involved as well. So when we've got player activities and social activities, the parents are also involved and getting the girls linked in with the club as a whole for events so rather than it being as it often is the girls section over here and you know other parts of the club over here is trying to get a better link up which will help socially connect them not just themselves but across the club as well teams within teams i love this the the group that came up with this had even pointed out that this could be grandparents carers you know the players themselves so trying to create throughout the season little teams where we're doing activities on and off the pitch. It could be around values of the game, could be around doing some good stuff or some recruitment. So again, a little bit of competition, but also creating a little bit of teamship within the team that we've got already. The building each other up is around that kind of supporting and the language that we're using. So we're trying to encourage people to be making friends and socially connect. And that'll link in in a second to that 10 minute pre training chat that we think is sometimes difficult for us as coaches but it's really important for the girls to be able to get some of that social connection. Players running their own pre-game warm-ups and pre-training warm-ups so we've spoken already about how important it is for the players and the girls especially to feel like they're involved and that they've got a voice. Motto of having fun, uh, girls owning and running their own social media group would suggest obviously that you always have um, an adult on that but it's a really good way for them to feel like they again are, are leading on something. Breaking down walls there's going to be quite a lot of uh, clubs potentially needing to cluster to start with so how can we ensure that those players that come together aren't just staying in their teams or their club teams but they're joining together. Designing your own kit, um, hosting end of season fun, Mixing up the age groups at training, which we'll talk about a little bit later to try and keep that connection. So some of the girls will be leaving age groups and going into another one. The girls who are coming out of that mixed rugby and into the under 12s is ensuring that we can still keep them with some of their friends that they've had. So doing a bit of training with the boys group as well. Players leading on their own projects, uh, bringing a friend to training, 
having encouraging team talk, which goes back to that language piece, <clears throat> excuse me, that language piece, and then the pre-training chat, making sure that we allow time for that, and spending time at the start of the season, getting to know each other off the pitch, because those connections off the pitch are really important for building the strength of the squad on the pitch. Lots of people spoke about buddy systems, WhatsApp groups for the age group, and then rugby days out to Red Roses games or club games, and a reward around that teamwork and effort on and off the pitch. So if you've got some of these already, awesome. And if there's anything in here that sparks a bit of interest, then um, just jot it down and we can explore it further as to what that looked like for the group that did that or are doing that currently. I'll hand over to Hannah to take us through question two. Lovely. Thanks, Tam. Um, so this one starts to explore a little bit around our stakeholders and how basically we can kind of engage them a little bit more. So we've divided this one up into different sections. So each slide as we go through will have a slightly different theme to it. So the first one we looked at was our local schools and basically how we can engage them better um, and what we can do to kind of um, keep, keep recruiting, keep engaging with them and keep getting that supply of players that we're all after. Um, one obvious theme that always comes up is majority of us are in a position where we're volunteers or we've got other jobs that we're working in. We're not necessarily full time rugby. And um, so how can we engage our schools, schools better in the time that we do have and with the resources that we do have? And um, so what some of the bits that came out of there were around utilizing our older players. So if we've got players within this in the school systems already, how can we engage with them so that they're um, either taking up those leadership positions, potentially getting a bit of work experience, whether it's coaching or managing within those sessions, but arguably they're going to be a hell of a better sell than us on in terms of engaging people at different age groups. And um, so how can we engage them better? Are there ways that we can have incentives within that? Because they're already within the schools and they're already in that setup ready. And um, building the primary school relationships, so if they're going into that transition period, period um, in that kind of under 11s, under 12 stage, as they're then coming into the primary school, how, how have we engaged the primary schools before that as they transition into that secondary school? And what does that look like in terms of the type of rugby they're playing? And um, again, P PE teachers are massive with this. Do, what's our relationship with like with our PE teachers? Are they rugby lovers? Do we need to kind of give them a bit, a bit of support in terms of upskilling? Are there any signposting? So for it might, might be that they're keen, but they're not aware of the resources that are there. And it might just be signposting them into some education or opportunities around that. Um, I know some of the local clubs have worked on getting flyers, posters, for example, um, and building that kind of just awareness of the girls that are there and that are playing. Um, as you kind of go through, we'll see different different experiences out there. I know probably some of you will have touched on some of these. Um, some of you may have done it in the past, had mixed successes, come back to it. It's one of those ones, obviously, each year you've got new players coming through, and, and especially now with the changes coming in, um, it's just a really nice opportunity to kind of bounce off the school environment and try and recruit from that. Well, and then other clubs, so people have already mentioned this, that they're collaborating with other clubs. So whether that's just for training to try and increase our numbers at our age groups and then also for playing games. I think it's really important that kind of final part on this, um, that point three, the friendly banding of teams. I think often in the past we've been really good in the girls game at collaborating and joining together. And sometimes it's been so good that that means that we've wanted to create a new identity for this team. Actually, we need to make sure that we're keeping a little bit of that club identity for those players. It's not about, oh, let's come and create this new one or everyone go over to this club. Because if we can keep recruiting, then we're going to be able to grow the game. If we all just send players to one place or send them all to another, then we kind of get it, we can get we can get a little bit complacent with well we've got enough numbers here so that friendly banding without feeling that there's a there's a poaching culture and that really comes down to the communication between the club coaches and looking really early at what your numbers might be who's in your local area that you can join up with and maybe sharing that training and going you know from venue to venue rather than always being at one place as well and having pitch up and play events so if you haven't got quite enough numbers, start bringing people in, having a little bit of a, a barbarians type training or um, games as well to try and help us with a little bit of upskilling. Because if we've got smaller numbers, it's harder to play those games. And especially in the older age groups, when we're going a bit more position specific and a bit more game understanding, um, it definitely helps to collaborate with other clubs. 
So the next session we looked at was all around um, our events that we can use to try and engage our engage our groups that we have or try and engage new players coming in and um, so barbecues is a classic one so most of you have probably had a bit of a barbecue situation in the past but it's one of those ones where it's just an opportunity to get people together i know some clubs in the past have done things like pizza and rugby watching so they've managed to put some rugby on on the main screen and then just got some pizzas in and it's just a nice ex excuse to get players together and start building a bit of that connection piece um girl guides groups and events so there's been quite a lot of work and promotion around girl guides and that kind of signposting and networking in um, so any any exposure you need, any there's always those little local networks of existing girl groups. How can we engage them in that transition period? Always really important. Um, some really interesting, some quite creative ones coming up around. So the fun fun days, different types of fun days that can come in. Um, we love the shopping center one. So it's just an opportunity, maybe a bit out of context. Go in get a bit of hype going going in your um, kits get a bit of promotion there but also just like recruiting people kind of a bit more organically in a setting that maybe you'd come across people that wouldn't you wouldn't normally cross over with so a really really nice example of like some of the open sessions we can do to try and recruit um, and engage players we wouldn't necessarily normally get next time brilliant and then the last one on here um put under other because it's got um, a lot of different areas in it so suggestions were around connecting with we've already mentioned girl guides but youth clubs councils sports centers local um school groups brownies guides and cubs anywhere that you think that there'll be girls of the age group that you're trying to recruit in so we might need to think outside the box that's why i quite like that shopping center idea or going down to the local sports center or somewhere you know a climbing center where there's girls who are clearly going to be athletic and might want to try something like touch rugby to start with so um think outside the box when we're talking about who we might need to collaborate with and the stakeholders that are out there um linking in with your cbs hopefully you all are already not just around money and funding but what's going on um, from their point of view in their women's and girls um, forums that they have, how they're linking in um, with other people within their area, their stakeholders as well. Social media, we've mentioned it a couple of times already, but using it to advertise and get your squad to engage with the community as well. Um, it's a really good way to get your message out there and you know, tagging different people in to try and get them to retweet, resupport, you know, let them know that you're recruiting. Um, paid social media advertising. So um, I haven't personally done it, but I know a lot of people who have, and it doesn't cost very much money. I can't tell you exactly how much it is, but it's really not a, a massive amount. And it just boosts your kind of activity. So it sends it out, however these things work. Um, but you can do it on Facebook as well. And it we've, we've definitely heard stories from people who've had really good responses because it's gone to a target audience, which means that your reach is much wider than you were expecting it to be. Um, and then the usuals around, you know, connecting with your own club and the club committee, um, tell them the story about your girls section, get your girls involved with activities within the club, because it's again, it's like that social media, but it's, it's being visible and making sure that people know that you're there. And then that collaboration, that working together makes it a lot easier. Um, another suggestion was getting in players to talk to players. So, you know, who's your who's your local Red Roses stars that you might be able to just drop a message to that used to be at your club or in your area. The girls are really, really keen to engage. And we've got a really, well, a fairly good mix of Prem 15s clubs across the country. So link in with, I know someone put in the chat earlier about working with um, Bristol Bears. So find out who you can connect with there and try and see if some of the girls will come down and speak to your players. I'm absolutely sure that they will because it's, you know, it's a, it's a lovely thing to do as a, a Hannah and I are both um, players. I'm probably on towards the end of that. Hannah's a, Hannah's a fresh faced, but um, we love coming back to, to clubs or going and speaking to people. So just find the right person, drop them a message probably on their social media and see if you can link in that way. All right, final one in our sharing feedback is around building contact confidence. So Hannah, do you want to kick us off with the, the pink bit? Yeah, absolutely. So the first bit, so the pink bit on the left hand side is all around. So as coaches, what can we do? So 
trying to break it down a little bit to identify the individual ne needs of the game zone skill zone, which we'll go on to a little bit later on. And those that you were here last time will have known, we explored it a little bit, but that identifying the needs obviously is a really important stage of that. And discussing with players how they can introduce the contact. So understanding the individual needs of your group. So what they want, what they're looking for, and a little bit of kind of just understanding what stage they're at. Um, I'm sure you all had experience of that. There's going to be a big range. Some people absolutely love it. Some people maybe need a little bit more time on that. So just understanding what, what your group needs at the stage they're at. Um, ensuring consistency and, um, and repetitiveness of the contact. Um, so just making sure our players are ready, that game fitness element is there, um, but also that they're able to do it when they are under fatigue and get, making sure that it's slowly building up to a stage that they're comfortable at. And then the last one is obviously around our safety element and making sure that we're in a position that they're always paired and always in a position that is appropriate for, for them at their stage of their development, position specifics, size specifics, um, and also just in terms of they might be they might be in a different different size demographic, but they might be fresh in that they may have come across from football. So just understanding where they're at in their in their development points. And then Tam's going to go on to explain a little bit the purple. So definitely some brilliant ideas in here about doing contact without it looking like contact. So when I used to go into schools as a community rugby coach and do a lot of introduction to, to rugby and to contact rugby um, with all different age groups of girls, it was, as soon as you said, do you want to do contact rugby? A lot of them were like, oh, no, 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 that's scary. But if you subtly brought it in with some wrestling games or some grab stuff, then they absolutely loved it. And they had no idea that that was actually the start of them doing contact. So some of it is just around that that, you know, I'm a bit scared. I see contact rugby on the TV. It's fully grown men running into each other as hard as they can. And, you know, that's not the game that they will be playing, but it may be the game, the only game that they've seen. So the contact side and the, the examples of some of the activities are often around things that aren't actually specific tackle technique. It's around that confidence to grab hold of somebody to be in close proximity. So wrestling games, Hugby, which is just another way for saying it's it's a grab kind of um, tackle rather than a full shoulder down to ground tackle. So it's getting used to being really close to someone grabbing a hold of them, slowing it down. So bringing it to a walking pace so people can build their confidence, slowing down games or playing games where um, you're playing a touch game. But as soon as there's a touch, we stop the game. There's a tackle made in a controlled situation and the ball's played away from that. So people get a chance to practice, not at full pace. Um, games where you've got the bib in the back of the shorts to be grabbed out. Again, you're wrapping your arms around to reach for that bib. Um, we've got quite a lot on the Keep Your Boots On um, YouTube channel with some ideas around the sock game as well. So taking a sock off uh, tied around somebody's leg. So there's lots of different ideas where the idea is to get the, the players closer together physically to get them used to that and not be so nervous around it. Um, I'll come back to the learning how to fall bit, but the starting on the knees, and building up the pace of the tackle, we would usually say starting on knees to kind of demonstrate. The only thing is, if we stay on our knees for too long, we take away a really important part of the tackle, which is trying to get our foot close. So the concept of being on knees means that we're, we're not falling as far. It's a little bit less scary probably for someone who um, hasn't fallen over very much, which is quite a lot of our kids nowadays. But actually we need to come off our knees and into that crouch position fairly quickly to make sure that we're getting used to having a foot close and, and how that player might move and how we might have to adjust as the tackler. Using things like tackle shields and crash mats and suits just to take a little bit of edge and also probably a little bit of fun as well to be able to dive onto a crash mat um, and using the ruck and the mall first as an exposure to contact. So again, it's that getting people used to being close to each other without it, it seeming like it's scary. Um, the reason I've come back to learning how to fall, it's, it's a really sort of key and probably nowadays missing piece of the puzzle around contact. If you think about back in the day and certainly when I was a kid, we were tripping each other up, we were falling over, we were playing games in the playground that involved us falling, we were climbing trees, probably falling out of them. And children just aren't doing that as much now, and especially girls who are new into a contact sport. It may sound ridiculous, 
But this learning how to fall, how to prevent your head from whiplashing when you land on the ground, how to not put your hand out, it's a really important part of our contact confidence and also our safety. So definitely don't dismiss it and expect that everybody knows how to fall. We definitely don't. And then and we'd encourage you to spend a little bit of extra time on that just to try and help with that safety element. Anna? Lovely. So I'm just going to go on to that last little section that's in grey around uh, who else can help. So use of experienced players for new players is always always a nice one just to try and get that peer to peer coaching and support. Um, but just one to be aware of and maybe a little bit cautious of is obviously your individuals, you know, you know what your individuals are like in terms of that peer to peer relationship. Um, and if you've been playing since you were eight and you're now 16, remembering what it's like to fall or make that first tackle can sometimes be quite hard to relate to. So if you've got someone that's maybe more experienced than the other person, so they've been going for six weeks, six months, that kind of stage, actually, sometimes the experience can be small and in the grand scale of rugby, but actually the experience is really, really relatable for those first initial steps they're taking. Um, bringing people in, so bring, have, having people that have different experiences, so it might be judo, might be um, managing contacts, so there's lots and lots of different different um, areas we can start to explore, so it might be an individual person that comes in, or it might just be as coaches, us going off and doing a bit of research of what, what different sports do in that kind of contact management side of things, we can be really useful for that. Um, obviously, Tam touched on it a little bit around the Keep Your Boots on page. There are um, quite a lot of good videos that are on there that give a real range of different activities you can do. Um, just so if you need a bit of kind of inspiration, it's quite a good touching point for, for you guys as coaches. Um, custom customize by using alternative equipment socks we've touched on that a little bit but again just having um, different options different alternatives keeping it a bit fresh and a, a bit different as we're working through the last one peer-to-peer -peer, we just talked about providing confidence for each other before but making sure we're reinforcing that in our coaching in our language and that our um, session design that we're going to go on to a little bit later but how we're creating our session de design to support our players as they're building that confidence in their steps Thanks, Tim. So thank you for everyone that was on um, last time and has given us all this really good feedback to be able to share. And hopefully um, people have been able to take some useful points or at least some food for thought from it. The next bit, we're just going to use this next part as a bit of signposting. So a few questions that came in over in the July one and then again this time around has been around the menstrual cycle and how it affects our athletes. So we're all going to be working with teenagers or about to become teenagers, probably still behaving like teenagers in that kind of 11, 12 category. Um, this is some research done by uh, women in sport, and they've done a lot of research around uh, girls, teenagers specifically. And if we know that this is true, then it's really important that we're, we're spending some time paying some attention to it. And probably from a coaching point of view, <clears throat> The biggest thing is that it shouldn't be a taboo subject. It's a part of life. We're coaching girls. Um, on this slide here, there's just a couple of different places that we're going to signpost you towards. So bottom left hand side, we have a partnership with Simply Health. And if you go onto their website, they've got some really interesting stuff around menstrual cycle, how it might affect an athlete's performance, mood, etc. Um, and we'd encourage you to have a look as coaches and then also to share that with your players, because if you can track your menstrual cycle, you've got a much better idea as an individual of knowing how you're feeling, why you're feeling like that, and also starting to understand and harness your hormones. On that right hand side there, the blue box, um, some of you may know this, there's an app called Fitter Women, which is what this screenshot is from. And they have been probably leading the way, to be perfectly honest, um, in terms of that tracking. So you can go on as an athlete yourself, track your cycle. They put on some really useful tips around different stages of when you might want to up your carbohydrates, when you might want to relax a little bit more, when you might be stressed. So it's a really useful place to go. They do also have, I've not used it, but they have a tool for coaches. So you could go on there as a coach and have your athletes as a part of it as well. I'm not selling this to you in any way, but it's, it's definitely a place to explore, especially at the moment. They've got um, quite a big campaign on at the moment, using different athletes, using different people to give their version of the story. And the most important part of it is that we're talking about it 
And if we can talk about it, it becomes much more normal for people to talk about it. And we'll start working out, getting a bit more research into how we can actually harness that because hormones are a crazy thing unless you're um, you're studying that as your probably as your master's your PhD etc but there's a lot more research going into it now so we'll put in the chat if it's not in there already a couple of signposts for you to go and just have a little explore yourselves as well and um, if that yes perfect thanks salty um, we'll also send this out at the end so that you can see where it is um, you can get some extra information as well Okay, big bit of the session today is around our session design. So we spoke a little bit about this last time. And again, some of the feedback when you've registered has been around you know, how do we cope with either low numbers or times where we've got an absolute brand new player in an under 16s age group who's playing alongside somebody who's been playing since they were five years old and knows everything about rugby. So Hannah and I are just going to have a bit of a conversation, share a couple of experiences that we've had from a coaching background, um, just to try and give some ideas of what we've done along the way. First up, you, those of you that were on the, the webinar last time around, you will have seen this slide. This again has come from Women in Sports Study, and they, they did this around lockdown, so it's it's still very relevant um, and they're doing some more research at the moment, but it's it's effectively what do girls want around their sporting environment and the ones that's really easy for us as coaches to take in are the no judgment, invoke excitement, clear emotional reward, giving the players a voice and then championing what they can get out of the sessions, what they can get out of the activity. So, just from a really simple basic take home from this slide is how we behave as coaches does have a massive impact on our players and especially our girls who are saying to us that they don't really like that judgment element they obviously they'll, they'll come a time in someone's life where there's going to be that performance and and that pressure however if it's our club sessions they want to have the freedom to play. They don't want that pressure. They don't want to feel judged. And especially girls who are, are coming new into that environment or are still have, suffering some of those effects of COVID and that isolation and, and feeling like they've been taken away from their friends. Invoking excitement, again, that is down to us. That's down to us and the energy that we bring to the sessions, but also how we plan our sessions. So if we've got elements of challenge, we've got elements where there's going to be discovery, there's going to be learning. The girls are saying that that's what they want. They want something to be, oh, what's that? Well, let me get curious about what that looks like. The emotional reward is those moments of pride. It's not necessarily about winning all the time. Yes, people do want to win. You'll have some very competitive players and coaches, I'm sure. But it's being able to reframe some achievements for certain players who need that confidence builder and that emotional reward. We spoke right at the start about giving girls a voice and a choice, so enabling them to feel empowered, to feel like they've got their input into a session, they've got what they want to do as well. That doesn't mean that as a coach we're just handing everything over to them, but we know that girls want to feel involved, they want to feel like they're valued and their voice is valued. So working out little ways that we can allow them to feel empowered and championing what's in it for them. So we've spoken already about that teamwork friendships all this all the good stuff that we know that rugby does but it's it's still our job as well to make sure that we kind of design those sessions we help with those social activities those off-pitch stuff to, to still kind of try and build those connections as well hand over to hannah for a couple of moments just to get us kick-started on our differentiation piece using game zone skills Lovely, thank you. Um, so those of you that have gone through the England Rugby Coaching Award or gone through some of your CPDs, kind of pushing pushing forward onto your advance, you may have seen this diagram before. Um, so it's basically underpinning that purpose, our purpose of our session is fundamental to all of our all of our different parts of our session. We've got our game zone and we've got our skill zone, which we touched on quite a lot in our last webinar. So if you weren't there and you're a bit like, I'm not sure what this, this is, 
go spend a bit of time looking back at that webinar one and um, but thinking about how we've got our game zone at the center of what we're doing our overall overall purpose of our session and how we're then utilizing that skill zone so it might be to stretch players it might be to give them an opportunity to maybe take away some of our pressures give it, put them into a slightly different environment to then allow them to really concentrate on the different skills or different actions that they're trying to complete within that um, and i know tammy you're saying there were some of the um challenges that um different people face that were fed in from the last one yeah so i've kind of split them into the three main areas of, of most feedback was around how do we how do we help support the players with that game sense or that positional understanding when we've got fewer numbers um generally how do we engage a smaller group so if we don't have a large amount of players and we haven't been able to cluster how can we make those sessions engaging and then the third one was around that which we mentioned already about different abilities within the same group you got anything off the bat to just to kick us off with an idea around any of those three Han? yeah absolutely so some of the um some of the bits from maybe around the small numbers for sessions so if we're thinking about our skill zones and how we're kind of building the stretch within them the different ways we can form our sessions to try and create different challenges so it might be that it's a competitive like you versus you activity so you've got set outcomes that happen and you're trying to get them to compete against themselves there might be that kind of smaller like 1v1 situation where we're trying to get them into different pressures applying different pressures as we go through and um, so it's just a one a classic example of doing that is how can we refine down an action so it might be our catch and pass it might be a kicking for example and we're taking it right right back in the skill zone to then adjust our different different constraints to be able to apply different pressures as we're going through nice um we've been looking a lot at session design for schools and trying to help them engage with again those brand new players that are coming in um, and one of the game zones that we suggest might be a nice idea for um, for coaches to use as well is around contact so if you've got a real mixed ability group some of them who are happy to tackle straight away no problem some of them who are pretty new who've got basic technique but maybe are lacking a bit of confidence is within the same game having certain players paired up so myself and hannah would be a pair and we're confident with our tackling so if hannah's carrying the ball she knows that if she runs anywhere near me i'm going to make a tackle on her and she's prepared and she's ready for that and vice versa but then within the team as well we would have the person next to me who might not be as confident so when she's making contact with her partner or with hannah it would be just a grab so Hannah knows that it's only going to be me and you, you could put us in bibs if you wanted, you could put us in headbands, sweat, well, you know, whatever you want. If you, if you feel there needs to be a, a visual representation of who's in what, what partnership, then you can do that. But the game would be either a touch game or a grab game, but there's differentiation within it. So rather than having to take the brand new players out and leave them, and maybe you've only got four, and then that only leaves another four who are playing a full contact game, you're able to just differentiate within that game zone. So my dog is uh, flapping his ears in the background. Um, you, yeah, you'd be able to differentiate within a game. So your numbers aren't getting reduced all of the time. And then you might, as Hannah said there, you might dip out into a skill zone with some of the players who need a bit more confidence, a little bit more development. And another skill zone can be going on where you're stretching, you're challenging the ones that are already pretty good at tackling but maybe they're not as good at reading where the attack is coming from. So can you set up a skill zone where they're going a little bit faster or the attack is coming from a slightly different direction? So we're differentiating in a game zone, but then we're also able to, to, to make those differentiations, but in that skill zone area as well. Just to build, just to build on that one, Tam. I really like that one. I've I've seen one a bit like that where it's been um, like traffic light system. So same concept. You're going in your game, and then if I'm like I'm not really sure, I'm going to give it an amber. It might be a walking tackle. But as I'm building, I'm like, okay, I've nailed some ambers. I might be like, okay, green, have a go. And then Tam's going to try and use her footwork to beat me. So it's the same concept, but you're just trying to bit. Then it gives them a bit of scope to wiggle either way. Would you be green? What color would you be? Against you, probably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Too much, too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the kind of the bit around not having enough players to be able to to help with that game understanding I completely understand that it, that is a challenge a lot of girls still don't watch a lot of rugby so building that connection with your your local prem 15s team red roses trying to get 
events or excitement built you know the world cup's coming up um which is going to be a great opportunity maybe to record the games and watch them back um so they might not be at very friendly times in uh, from new zealand to us but trying to get the girls to watch a little bit more it really really helps with game understanding um to be able to watch a game to just start getting an idea and then also again thinking outside the box can you set up a scenario you don't need 16 players to set up a scrum you can use scrum triangles you can reduce those numbers down you can you could use somebody holding a tackle shield and a player leaning against that as if they were a number eight at the back of the scrum and another player acting as if they're picking from the back of the scrum so you can set up scenarios that's just it's zooming in on a small part of the game that might be either position specific or tactically and just having a look at that and then setting it in its context when you've maybe got some some games to watch or you've got more people there but don't be afraid of of taking a little chunk of something and having a look in depth and setting something up that looks like a line out but just so that you can see how your scrum half would play away from that or it might be defending off the back of the line out or maybe tactical kicking as well to so set the scenario actually this is where we are on the pitch okay this is where we've got pressure from the defense here where would we look to set up from this breakdown to try and kick and relieve pressure or whatever whatever that tactical or positional specific um, scenario might be anything on you hannah yeah and so just just kind of building on from that a little bit i've seen people do stuff where they um have taken that kind of little chunk that tam's talking about and then just ask players to like go have a look so like go youtube it go go try and find a really example of a 3v2 for example like try and find some examples and then take that away and then it's something that they can like everyone's got it on their phone now it's really really easy to do but it could be a five ten minute activity for them to go off and do and then come back and and have a go at doing so they're almost kind of building their own like has anyone got any good examples of a scrum go do some research then next week we'll we've got our set play utilizing our little um our scrum triangle and then we're going to go play from that and then bit, a bit of creativity a bit of action engaged with it but kind of giving a bit of ownership to the players that actually if it, you're here and we'd like to engage with you like let's bring bring your ideas to the table yeah definitely and we we know it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to start off with it always is when there's a change in the age bands or a change you know change always makes it things a little bit scary but it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing and and this will be good for the girls game to have that difference and start making it only two years instead of a three-year age banding as it was which <laughs> We all knew was a little bit of a problem sorry it's a vizsla by the way whoever asked me what dog it is a vizsla and he's off his head absolutely off his head um so i've completely lost my train of thought but basically having those different um age bands is going to be a challenge to start with to get the new players in but we've already spoken about some really brilliant ideas of how we can recruit how we can retain ideas of different barbecues that we can have um so I'd, I'd say from a positive point of view stick with it and if we can make these sessions engaging the girls are going to go back to their schools back to their colleges and go oh that was really cool why don't you come and try this and that's how we're going to grow the game so hopefully one day we don't have to have these dual age bands we can have girls playing at all age groups in the near future and not having to to jump between them which takes us on to just a little bit more of a chat around this, um, the new age bands that obviously came in on the 1st of August. So we would suggest, and it is, it is just a suggestion from us, that there is no reason why you can't play the age group, the age group down from the one that you'll be, you're now coming into in August. So giving the girls a chance to get used to what those new age bands would be. We did it post COVID. As, a, as an organization, as a governing body, because we understood that there was a, a little bit of change. Players hadn't been together. They hadn't, they'd maybe missed an entire season. So this would just allow you that extra bit of time as coaches to develop some of the skills, especially around line out, scrum and kicking, which do take jumps as we go up those dual age bands. It also means as a starting point, you would have less numbers needed in your games because if you're playing down up to once you get to the under 16s, but down the age groups, you need less players for the games that you'd be playing. So if you're worried about numbers and recruiting, that would be an opportunity 
to speak to to your opposition clubs and just say look can we for these first couple of games play down into what would be under 13s or under 15s etc until we're used to it and then when we come to post christmas when we've had much more of an opportunity to actually train and develop those skills then we'll have a go at it as well so again food for thought for for everyone it was done last year um it worked really well we had positive feedback from the game that that helped enable people to feel like they were upskilling um because we understand that this is just a very crude uh, table to show some of the the kind of changes in the um the rules that we would need to focus on as coaches so as you're going up if you think about where the players have come from that's that that previous rules and then what we, they're going to be going into. Um, there are some big changes, especially around scrum line out and, and the, the ability, not the ability to kick, but being allowed to kick. Um, and we know that we're still kind of trying to grow that element of the girls game is around kicking. There's a lot more players coming from football who've naturally kicked a ball a lot more, but actually just getting our players used to kicking a ball, getting used to what that feels like, and that as a skill means that we're not going to just suddenly jump into under 14s and expect everyone to know what they're doing. So it's building that in a bit more gradually, building in the scrum, you know, that moves from three to five to eight. And the same with the line out. So you don't have to go straight in there with fully contested line outs at under 16. If your players aren't confident, they've come, you know, they've come in brand new, then we would just build that up to a no lift a lift and then start contesting it. So I'm sure it's stuff that um, that everybody's thinking about already, but just from, um, from our point of view, we would definitely recommend that there is nothing wrong with bringing this in slowly and there's no deep expectation that we have to do something just because we're under 16s, we can play down if we need to. Salty, I don't know if you wanted to add anything in on that. No, I, I think it's just a confirmation that anywhere in the age grade game, um, this is this is doable. Um, you know what the the regulations on the rules for an age group do is they they show that threshold as you say to which you can go to, um, but you can do anything below that. You know you could go back and play touch rugby if you want, if that's the right progression and game for the players themselves. So um, so that is possible, and, and what we're trying to do is look at um how coaches can help and work with each other to be able to help the progressions towards what the full game will eventually be more mute thank you all right we are on to the last 10 minutes what we're going to do is pop you into some breakout rooms and we're only going to give you five minutes to collaborate with the people in your room to come up with, I, I know there's a couple of things in the chat room, a couple of questions in there that we'll have a look at if they're not already answered, um, but come up with top two questions on some of the content or perhaps some content that we haven't managed to get through. And if we've got time for the last five minutes, we will get one person from your group to just ask your top question and we'll go around the rooms and see if we can get a little bit more interaction from you all and hopefully Try and answer your questions. If we can't answer them straight away, we will go away and try and find out the information and it will be sent to you at the end. Salty? Yeah, shall I jump in there? Um, Sarah, thanks very much for the question. I don't think we're saying it's a formal, um, a formal regulation or anything. It's definitely a, um, a recommended approach to help the girls stay ready and to take those stepping stones as we talked about. But you're right, actually, what we could do is publicise that, that idea more widely. You're right, and we can do that through um, various channels and things that we've got, both to the girls' game, on our coaches, social media, and things like that. So it's a, it's a good one. We'll take that on and, and help people understand that you know they can do it anyway. Um, and it's a good idea to, to make sure that the game that they're playing is appropriate to the players they've got. So yeah, it's a good, good idea. Becky, did you have a point on, on that one? Yeah, I think key message that I would want all club coaches to sort of show consideration for is the not expected to have the girls ready by the 1st of September. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely not, not where we, we want that pressure to go. So let's alleviate the pressure on the coaches and the players and say, right, let's break down where we want to be 
at each point and look at the, the planning and preparation that you do and align that to how you want to play the game. Take the pressure off the coaches in the expectation that they're going to teach everything to the players by the beginning of the season. And because I just I think it puts an unnecessary pressure on everyone. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Becky. This this would probably just be my own kind of opinion on it, would be around trying to get them to to engage like below and above. So do some stuff, some obviously non-contact stuff with the women to get that connection, but then also keep linking them back 16s and 18s together to do again some of that activity. So it keeps them at it keeps them at the club as still look you're you're still part of this group, but you've also you've got a link back to that 16s, 18s, but you've also connected to the women, but you're you're kind of a bit of both so that you don't lose them either way, either because they feel like it's not their place to be there or that they feel like they're only with the women and then they won't remain with um, with that yeah. under 18s age group. Yeah. I yeah. Think, oh. can, can I just add there as well, Tam? Yeah. I think the other thing is, and Keith put the, his comment in the uh, chat, which is important, is what the girls' game and women's game does really well is think about the game. Um, and people on this call have heard me say before, the boys' game is rubbish at it. Um, and and what the girls' game does is thinks, what can we do to maximise the number of players we all have, not who are in just my club. It's not a selfish system. Um, so that that working with other clubs, that thinking about how do you work across age groups, how do you even work with your your men's club and boys club to to support it as well. Um, I think that that principle is massively important, and, and the girls' game is brilliant at it. Um, you know, you're not on your own. I think that's a, a key message as well. And as Tam is saying, there's other people and other ways to try and keep those girls engaged, keep them enthusiastic about the game. Um, and, and their parents as well for, for that year while you wait for the others to come and join them. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's definitely difficult. And I've seen that firsthand. Um, a girl up near me who was playing at a club, who played all the way through. And then not only did she have to leave that group of players she had played with, she also had to change clubs because there wasn't a girls at the time under 13's team for her to go into. And that was that was tough on her as an individual having to to move across. And the big thing that's kept her at the new club and the new team was the support from the coaching staff. She's become now, this is a couple of years ago, she's become a sort of leader and a captain within that group because of the support they put around her to be like, right, you can, we're going to challenge you and, and keep progressing you. However, do you know what? You've got some really good skills that you can help support the other girls around you but we're not going to just leave you to do that so you never feel like you're developing we're also going to challenge you she ended up doing quite a few touch games and stuff with that with the age group above to keep her her basic skill levels up so it, it it's tough it's tough when anyone's leaving you know going to a new school going to a new team um and there is a challenge because it's brilliant that there's now girls who are who have come through minis and have played rugby, but there's the challenge of them combining with girls who've never seen a rugby ball in their lives. So that kind of differentiation piece around some of the stuff at training is important. And I would, I would seriously encourage you to keep them with that boys age group as well, to do things with them still. Um, even if it's, she can go and, or a couple of them can do a little skill zone with some of those boys if you happen to train on the same night or do some Sunday activities together, at least to start that transition and then ease into that girls team. Tomorrow, sorry, sorry to butt in there, but yeah. have I read it correctly that as long as the coaches are in agreement, agreement that that under 12 girl can actually play full contact with the under 12 boys? So I'm sure I read somewhere on the paperwork that actually they could, as long as it was, as long as she was physically able and it was acceptable by the coaches, that they could actually still continue to play under 12s boys. No, they... no, that that's not the case, Stephen. No, that regulation-wise, it's a, it's a separate uh, gender age group now, so they can't play contact rugby together. They can play non-contact, um, but they can't play oh. contact rugby together. But we, if we've got, let's say, three or four or five girls in the under 11s, we can try and drag them up to under 12s as long as they're playing under under 11's age group rules. 
laws. Correct. Yeah. So that so you can combine those two. Um, sorry, they they can play up. Sorry, um, into under twelve. But again, be really careful that they are ready and win because ultimately the most important people in all of this are the individual players. They need to be playing at the right 100%, level. So have a look at the regulations. I'll put the link in, actually. I'll put the link in the chat now. So this is why I'm going to interject on this. For me, it's not down to the RFU. It's down to our clubs to ensure we're educating all of our members that yes, our volunteers to ensure that they're getting the right message across and being welcoming to anyone and everyone that turns up. For me, I don't see what the RF you can do about that. That has to be a club's responsibility as part of looking after all of their volunteers and aligning it to the core values of the game, but also the club's own ethos. If it's not led by a club, then that's down to the club. There's nothing the RFU can ever do about that. Unless, unless Mark, Tam, Hannah, you tell me something different and you've got some initiatives that you can do. Probably a wider problem, Stephen, of society as well, to be perfectly Absolutely honest. Absolutely it is, especially where I live. But... It, it could be, this could be quite a meaty uh, topic. We'll, we'll have a look in the chat afterwards about if there is any you know, specific stuff we can send out to you around that you know, education piece around inclusion. Um, to try and send out to some of those mini coaches but Becky is right it's not just because she's jumped in there but that it is down to those clubs and what their values are and you know their the the, the, the behaviors of those coaches to make sessions inclusive if a girl turns up then you know we would hope that they would stay are we advertising enough to show that you know mini rugby is for girls as well that you know that could be another topic of conversation as say that you can't form a team of girls only um, at age groups. I think probably going back to Steve's point is we've we've not seen as many girls in that mini age group. So if we can grow that, and that's those links that we talked about right at the start of the webinar with primary schools, they're do a lot of them are doing tag rugby already. It's how can we as club coaches get that link across? Do we have boys who are already at those primary schools that we can use as ambassadors to say, you know, rugby is for everyone. Get yourselves mm. along. We could start a girls team, and and that's kind of a, a bigger societal issue of you know getting those those boys to support the girls, and that rugby is for girls as well. And there's some there's some brilliant ambassadors out there within our clubs, player wise and coaches. So finding them, yeah. using them to spread the word, and uh, yeah, hopefully one day if if girls want to play as just girls in that mini age group, that would be brilliant. And if they want to play mixed up to the under 11s, then that's also brilliant. So let's take over the world, Vicky. Let's do it. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Um, just as an in-between, in between, there was a couple of clubs I've had experience of doing like a once a month, all of the girls, no matter what age group, come together for like a super fun session. And they basically were just like, and they used it as a real sell to be like, today you're going to the girls session. And, and it was like a coming together all the different age groups. But it was like once a month, they went out, even if it was just for like 20 minutes, they all came together, had a really fun session and went back to their sessions. And it was a really nice way of like making it feel a bit special taking away some of the barriers of like, I don't know anyone, and then just giving them an experience of like, that was a bit different as well, which is- Yeah, I like that. Nice, doing it. nice. thanks, Han. I don't know off the top of my head, do you, Sophie? <laughs> Should I jump in? Yeah. Just really quick, we're having a look at Inner Warrior um, and how we can try and um, make sure from a girl's perspective, it reflects the new age bands. Um, it does do some of what we've been talking about here, just linking into that recruitment um, or more targeted recruitment in the school sector or colleges as well. Um, there'll be more information out about it ASAP. We're a bit keen to try and let the start of season crack on first before we throw in something different. Um, so that that's the, the aim at the moment. But it's, it's being worked up and there'll be information coming out pretty soon to to sort of build on what the start of season does and then we take it from there really um but yeah quite and as we put in the chat earlier on the links with the uh, premier 15s clubs and their support in that is part of it as well they're, they're keen to get more involved which does some of that role modeling that we've talked about earlier on 
Um, it's 16 minutes past eight, so we're gonna call the officialness um, to a close. If you want to stay on and ask any questions, then um, please do. Again, we'll save the chat, and obviously this has been recorded, so that will get sent out as well, so you can listen back.